Right, I think probably a good place to start is that every era in history has its bogeyman. And I think that we're particularly fortunate at the moment because we've got four. Um, we've got food crisis, we've got the financial crisis, we've got the climate change crisis, and of course we've got the energy crisis. And it could be argued that perhaps the most important of all of those is the energy crisis, because the energy helps us transport the food, it also cre creates the problems that we have with the climate at the moment, uh, energy drives our industry, um, all of these things are interrelated, and the energy crisis is something that's actually going to make the climate change crisis an awful lot worse. And the reason for that is that the population of the Earth is growing at an enormous rate, at something like 165,000 new people every day. And I think it's a sobering thought to realise that if those people use just the same amount of electricity that we use today, we need to build a one gigawatt power station every single day just to keep pace with the electricity use. And it's even more sobering when you think that the electricity only accounts for one third of the energy we use on the planet. So for every one gigawatt power station, we need another two gigawatts to keep track for the population and keep them moving. So there are several ways that we can address this. We can go for renewables, and I think that there's a good drive for renewables at the moment. Um, we could also go for nuclear, but there's a, a lot of reaction against, against using nuclear. But the thing that's absolutely clear is that we can't stay with fossil fuels. And the reason we can't stay with fossil fuels is that for every one kilowatt of electricity we use, one kilogram of carbon is produced. If we go to gas, that's down to about 600 grams of carbon. Even if we go to solar cells, we're still running at something like 200 grams of carbon. The only source of electricity that we have that produces virtually no carbon is nuclear, which produces on average four grams over the uh, per kilowatt hour average over the lifespan of the nuclear reactor. So whatever basket of fuels we choose, it's clear that nuclear has to be part of that, that basket. Partly to account for the electricity that we're using at the moment, but also to help shift the energy that we're using in transport and heating, the other two thirds of the energy, over to an electricity supply which is clean. So to me, it's clear that we have to go down a nuclear route. The problem is, there's a lot of scepticism about nuclear, particularly post Fukushima. Whether this is right or wrong, it's a real feeling that people have. They're worried about the waste. They're worried about safety. They're worried about nuclear proliferation. And all of those things are genuine worries. Personally, I'm not worried about them because I believe the nuclear industry is doing a tremendous job at the moment. But nonetheless, we have to try and alleviate those fears. So, how do we address this? Well, we could stay with the nuclear fuels that we have at the moment. Uranium is a good source. You dig uranium out of the ground, mainly uranium-238, but only 0.3% is uranium-235, the thing that does the job in a nuclear reactor. We have to enrich that uranium to about 3% to produce nuclear fuel. We then build a reactor which is critical. And the way that the reactor works is that each uranium-235 nucleus spontaneously undergoes fission, and it emits on average about two neutrons. Each one of those neutrons then goes on to split another uranium atom, and another one, and another one, and that's the chain reaction. And you can create a sustainable reaction, chain reaction, by absorbing some of the neutrons that you're producing, so that on average only one neutron then goes along to create another fission. And that's the chain reaction that we use inside a nuclear reactor. Every atom that splits, every nucleus that splits, generates the energy that drives the heat, that drives the turbines, that produce the electricity. The only trouble is that there is a lot of uranium-238 in there that is not undergoing fission. The uranium-238 absorbs a neutron and eventually decays down and becomes plutonium-239. And plutonium-239 is great if you want to make bombs. 
So we could use, keep on using uranium um, at the risk of producing more plutonium and other forms of higher nuclear waste that we then have to deal with, perhaps buried in the ground or whatever. We could do that, except for one thing, and that is that there are estimates that we might only have another 80 years of uranium left. So if we're wanting to produce more electricity cleanly, we'll be using more fuel. If we're using more fuel, we're using more uranium, and the uranium is unlikely to last. So we need an alternative. One of those alternatives would be to actually breed plutonium in a purposeful way and use the plutonium as the fuel to fuel the reactor of the future. And you do this by letting the uranium-238 absorb a neutron and produce plutonium. You enrich the plutonium, you breed more plutonium, and then that becomes the fuel. Now, personally, I'm uncomfortable with a power source that is fueled by something that makes pretty good bombs. So we could possibly look at something else. And that something else is the element thorium. It's in the periodic table here. It's been sitting around there for a long time. And it has actually been used as a nuclear fuel in the past. And in fact, in the early days of nuclear energy, going back 50, 60 years or more, there was a suggestion that we should actually drive our nuclear energy using thorium rather than uranium. There is an anecdotal story that we don't do that because in the early days of nuclear energy, nuclear power, nuclear reactors for civil purposes and the bombs were very closely linked because they were both under control of the American military. The American military wanted uranium reactors because it produced plutonium. Personally, I don't think that's the reason. I think the reason is that the military worked out how to refine the uranium and refine the plutonium and handed that information over to the civil nuclear power plants so they didn't have to invest a lot in R&D to produce their fuel. But Weinberg in particular, Alvin Weinberg, Nobel laureate, was very keen to use thorium. And in fact, through his life, he suggested that thorium was possibly the better, cleaner fuel. Why? Because it only occurs in nature as thorium-232. So you don't have to refine it. You can dig it out of the ground and use it. It's four times more plentiful than uranium. It's about as plentiful as um, lead is on the surface of the planet. And it's generally find, found in benign countries. So if we're talking about energy security, we can get our thorium from, from Norway, from India, from Australia, and even from Wales. So there's a good source of thorium. At the moment, it's not used for anything, really. It's a waste product. Um, we hear a lot about windmills, and we hear how windmills are clean. If you look at the mining of the rare earth metals that are, need, that, that are needed to make the wind turbines, the mining takes place in China. You have never seen such devastation of a landscape. But interestingly enough, a byproduct of that devastation is thorium oxide. And the Chinese don't really know what to do with it. Except they do. Because they realize they've got a sustainable supply of thorium, so they're currently investing a lot of money in developing thorium reactors. Similarly in India. India doesn't have very much uranium, but it has a vast amount of thorium. So the Indians are investing a lot of money in thorium reactors. And in fact, the only thorium reactor that's running on the planet at the moment is running in India. But a lot of this technology is based on technology that was developed maybe 50 years ago in, in the States. And in fact, the States ran thorium reactors for quite a long time, generating electricity for the grid. So how could we use thorium now? Well, the thing about thorium itself is that it is radioactive, but not very much. But you can make it into a, a radioactive, make it into a fuel source, a fissionable uh, nucleus, by letting it absorb a neutron. And it could absorb that neutron by, for example, putting thorium inside a conventional reactor. What happens is that the thorium absorbs a neutron. It becomes the, the wonderfully named protactinium. The protactinium then decays and becomes uranium-233. And uranium-233 is probably the best isotope in the entire periodic table to use as a fuel. So you need that neutron to turn thorium into a usable fuel. But there are several ways you can do that. As I've said, you can put thorium in a conventional reactor, 
make it undergo this perfect on this fertile to fissile conversion. Or you could do something that's slightly more esoteric, slightly cleverer than that. And that is that some years ago in the UK, we built the ISIS relation neutron source, the most powerful source of neutrons on the planet at the time and for the next 20 years. And these neutrons were used to study materials. And we needed intense beams of neutrons. So if we can produce intense beams of neutrons, can we produce intense beams of neutrons that will convert thorium into uranium-233? And the answer is yes, it's safe. We use spallation. Spallation is where you take an accelerator, you accelerate protons to a very high energy, and you bang them into a heavy metal target, like lead. And for every proton, you generate 30 neutrons. And these 30 neutrons can then go on to convert the thorium into uranium-233. And we've done the calculations, and that just about works. It doesn't quite work, but it just about works. But it does open the possibility of building an entirely new type of reactor, a subcritical reactor. Remember, in the conventional reactors, you require the neutrons that are produced by the fission to go on and create the next fission. That's called a critical reactor. It's critical because it runs on its own. Too many neutrons and you have a bomb, too few and the reaction just dies away. But if you buried a spallation target inside the core of a conventional reactor, what you could do is take the proton beam into the reactor, produce the neutrons, which convert the thorium into uranium-233, but then also make the uranium-233 go through the fission process. And this is really quite a remarkable trick. It's almost magical. It gives you a reactor which is subcritical. In other words, if you switch off the proton beam, that fission stops because there aren't any neutrons to, develop, to produce the fission that you need to generate the heat. So that's the, that's the first good thing about it. The next good thing about it is that you need a lot of energy to drive a particle accelerator. You need, perhaps, for the sort of particle accelerator we're talking about, about a 10 megawatt accelerator. And to drive a 10 megawatt accelerator, you need about 20 megawatts of energy. But if you're using that accelerator into a subcritical core, you can generate something like 1300 megawatts of thermal energy, which you can then convert to something like 660 megawatts of electrical energy. And you can take 20 megawatts of that electrical energy, feed it back into your accelerator, and the rest of the electricity goes out into the, uh, into the grid. So you've got an energy amplifier. You've got a 10 megawatt accelerator generating 600 megawatts of electricity. So that's, that's pretty good. That's a good way of generating electricity. It's not going to completely take over from conventional reactors, but under certain circumstances, it could be a really exciting way to help solve the energy crisis. But then, of course, it's still nuclear, and people are worried about nuclear waste, about the americium, about the plutonium, about the stuff that can take tens of thousands of years to decay. But the good news about thorium is that it only generates about a 20,000th of that radiotoxic waste that is produced in conventional reactors. But more than that, the waste that we've already produced, the so-called legacy waste that we've produced from the last 50 years of uh, uh, generating electricity by nuclear means, is sitting around. We don't know what to do with it. We talk about putting it in the ground, shooting it into space, dumping it in the sea. We're not sure what to do with it. It's a liability. But if you take that liability, that radiotoxic waste, and you mix it with the thorium, and you put it in an accelerator-driven subcritical reactor, you can actually transmute that waste. You can burn it. You can make it undergo the same fission processes that generate the heat that generates the electricity. So an ideal scenario would be, for example, to build a conventional reactor, possibly fueled with thorium fuel, and put next to it an accelerator-driven subcritical reactor. So you simply take the waste from one, you put it in the other, and you burn it. And you reduce the radiotoxicity of that waste from something like 10,000 years to a few hundred years. It's still radioactive. 
but it's nowhere near as radioactive and as poisonous as it would be if it were generated by a conventional reactor. So, that's my particular solution to the energy crisis. I am not employed by any nuclear industry, and I have no links with the nuclear industry. It's just some ideas that have come from the research that I've been doing over the last 30 or 40 years. <coughs> but I think it will work. And what's standing in the way at the moment is the fact that there is zero investment by the governments in new forms of nuclear energy that are clean, sustainable, and capable of ridding us of, of existing waste. And I think that that's where the money should be invested. And it's, it's quite interesting, there was a debate in Parliament not very long ago, and the question was asked, why is the government subsidising wind when it's not subsidising nuclear? And the answer was, we're only subsidising new forms of energy, to which the answer was, but windmills are a thousand years old. <laughs> Stop there.